not clear just what it is you're investigating here. Two of your men have died in the past two weeks, allegedly of self-inflicted injuries. And I've taken every measure to see it doesn't happen again. Colonel Wharton, a, uh, a certain ritual sign was found at the scene of both deaths. Is there anything you can tell us about that? Not much. Apparently, it's some sort of voodoo, Margie. But you haven't investigated it as a possibility. All I know is voodoo caused a riot in my camp. Discovering the X-Files, the podcast in which a newbie takes a deep dive into the entirety of Chris Carter's universe, while longtime fans escort me on the journey, a perilous journey filled with government conspiracies or weird monsters every other week. I'm Eric's Antoine, and today Daniel and I will be discussing Fresh Bones, which originally aired on February 3rd, 1995. It was written by Howard Gordon and directed by Rob Bowman. In this episode, Mulder and Scully investigate a series of mysterious deaths and disappearances linked to voodoo rituals. This leads them to a Haitian refugee center where it seems the colonel in charge is actually up to no good. And he may want to harness that voodoo power for himself and his nefarious ambitions. It has all the makings of a good occult horror film and in a moment, Daniel and I are going to talk all about it. Stick around. So I'm a big fan, and you you probably are fond of it as well, but I'm a big fan of The Serpent and the Rainbow. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) You know, it's... I don't know how often it comes up in Wes Craven's Oove, but I'm a big fan of that movie, and I kind of have a personal connection to it uh, only because my father made a documentary about Haiti. Oh, yeah? Uh, yeah, in the 80s. This documentary was call- is called uh, Crick Crack Tales of a Nightmare. It's a, it's, a, it's a good documentary that basically observes the Duvalier regime throughout the years and essentially chronicles that and sort of leads to the fall of baby Doc Duvalier in the whatever year that was, the late 80s. And so I think it was 88, 87 or 88. So it's a pretty interesting documentary. And of course, it it touches on aspects of voodoo culture and things of that nature. But it is a documentary, not a fantasy film or a horror film, even though it does have some horrific imagery and whatnot. I do recommend it. So there is that, right? So I grew up um, I, my father took years to make that documentary. So as a kid, I was surrounded by that stuff, by, by Haitian culture and Haitian imagery and that sort of thing. I always found it very interesting. And when The Serpent and the Rainbow came out, see, this is, a, I, I don't know what year it was anymore, probably 87 or 88, right? Yeah, it was but, around there. Right. And typically... You know, I, I was raised by bohemian parents, essentially, and my stepmom wasn't really a big into, like, big mainstream commercial Hollywood movies. So usually going out to the movies with my parents meant going to, like, the film forum or, you know, to see some Fellini retrospective or going to, like, the Paris uh, Theater in, in New York uh, to watch some, you know, Kurosawa's Ron, you know, like... I watched foreign films, art films, stuff like that growing up. My parents took me to see those movies, and they didn't typically take me to see some mainstream horror film. But because of the subject matter of The Serpent and the Rainbow, had to do with Haiti, had to do with voodoo, was based on a book by Wade Davis, who was name-dropped in the episode. Yes. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) It was very much like, well, we should go see this movie. And that was... So for me, it was, oh, we're going to see, like... A movie that I that I really want to see, a movie that I'm seeing trailers for on TV, and like <laughs> a movie like from the director of Nightmare on Elm Street, and a movie that looks really awesome, and I can't wait to see it. And so it was a it was an event for me to go see Serpent in the Rainbow, and 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, my parents who had been studying Haitian culture and all that stuff knew the movie to be a bunch of bullshit. But it is very entertaining bullshit. And, yeah. <laughs> I, th I, and I think that had enough going on. Uh, you know, I haven't read Wade Davis's book, but and even Wade Davis himself did eventually say that the, the film was largely an exaggeration of his experiences. As anybody who's seen the movie would say, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I somehow doubt that Wade Davis was ever strapped to a chair uh, and, and like tortured by the, I, I don't know. And and then like so, some of the stuff that, that he envisions is very, you know, spectacular. And so, I, I mean, I'm sure that it, it, of course it's an exaggeration, but so watching this episode, as you can probably imagine that, uh, that film was very much on my mind throughout it. And I think that they exploit the topic fairly well. It's a very intriguing topic. Howard Gordon uh, presumably wrote it because uh, he heard of uh, two um, US Army people who had committed suicide. Uh, they had been stationed in Haiti, I guess. And I think the initial, what they initially wanted to do was actually shoot in Haiti, set the episode in Haiti and shoot it there. That of course proved to be prohibitive yeah. So they came up with this idea of a refugee camp, which works. I mean, it wor it works yeah. just as well. It, you know, there's it doesn't feel like too much of a stretch. And uh, it, I mean, it's fine. It's 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 a very interesting episode where you know Howard Gordon gets to indulge some of his political ideas, puts them in there. Uh, we've got some interesting characters. We've got Daniel Benzali, you know, <laughs> who who is very much of the uh, the kids aren't in cages. They're very comfortable uh, variety. You know? <laughs> uh, so, so you have that going for it. Uh, you've got Bruce Young as the, I guess the voodoo priest. Uh, I, I can't really think of what else to call him, but I guess that's what he is. Yeah, it's an intriguing episode. I'd, I'd like to hear your take on it. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. And uh, of course, diving into spoilers, we end up finding out that uh, David Benzali's character is the villain. So, I guess you could say he's a culturally appropriating villain. Oh, yes. Which is also kind of uh, still a relevant topic these days. It, it's not really, it's not demonizing the Haitian voodoo priest. It's the white man that is corrupting the religion for exactly. his own means that is the villain behind everything. Yes. He's misusing. He's misusing. Yes. Uh, yes. That, that, that's why his comeuppance at the end is that, you know, the... Presumably, uh, God, Bouvet, Bo Bouvet uh, yeah. um, Bruce Young, rises from the dead and essentially tells him, you know, he who does evil uh, must, you know, receive evil or whatever it is that he tells him. Yeah. And that is, you know, that is his comeuppance. Uh, so that, in theory, voodoo should not be used for evil. And once again, you so you have here a person who is using it for evil and and corrupting and, and misusing uh, something that is considered sacred by the people who believe it and practice it, by natives who believe it and practice it. It's got a lot of really interesting aspects in the episode. I mean, you obviously you have sigils all over the place. We have the ghost of a dead boy who can also turn into a cat. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a whole lot going on around here. Yeah, that's that was also very intriguing, and it's a, it's it's something that they sort of throw throw in there because it's the ghost of a dead boy, but it's the ghost of a dead boy who eats French fries, and because because I mean I got it right. I mean, the the implication is that he died before this story takes place in a riot. He's, yeah. Yeah, so that so that part I got right. I mean, he's not, he's been dead since before the story's events. Yes. So they met a ghost. They met uh, a zombie. They met you know a dead boy, and they took him to eat burgers and fries. You know, yeah. and so you go. And Mulder gave him five dollars for protection. Yes, <laughs> yes, and I'm just like, okay, well that's very intriguing, and and that's why you you once again, well you know Howard Gordon. Again, it's a solo writing thing from him this time, not with Alex Ganza. And so there are some ideas here 
that maybe are not entirely cohesive. I mean, it's an X file, but once again, as we've done in the past, as we've done with episodes like Shadows or Born Again, you're delving into not necessarily, yes, of course, there's an element of the, of the paranormal, but uh, you are moving away once again from scientific concepts and getting into metaphysics and mysticism and myth and uh, things that, again, are not necessarily tangible. I want to be clear, I enjoyed this episode and I think it's entertaining. What I'm not sure of is if it entirely works within the, the, within the construct of what the X-Files is. I think we're running into a little bit of a problem where they're trying to pass off this sort of mystical stuff as completely believable. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And that's where I think they occasionally run into problems because it doesn't mesh with the general scientifically grounded tone of the series. The usual scientifically grounded tone of the series. Uh, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. It hasn't really... We haven't really dealt with a whole lot of spiritualism in mm -hmm. any of these episodes so far. You know, there's been a little bit... You had the Satanists in the episode before this. And a couple other things here and there, you know, beyond the sea and any time we've dealt with ghosts. But on the whole, everything's always hewed closer to aliens, sci-fi, or if we're going supernatural, it's been on the mon more of the monster side of things in general, not so much in terms of religion and magic. So it always gets a little fuzzy when we enter, you know, these kind of subjects, at least early on this in the series. I think it blends together better as it goes on, but... It's it's they still haven't quite defined everything yet. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a difficult. It's just that it's difficult to define because I think that when Chris Carter created the show, he sort of wanted to have like a catch-all. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. He he really wanted to explore these these sci-fi horror topics, and he knows that they this goes all over the place. The genre goes all over the place. So you, you can have sci-fi horror, you can have more grounded horror, you can have supernatural horror, and all and he, they're trying to make this show work for all of it. Yeah. And I think that on a general, like on a superficial level, it still works. Yes, you, yes. You have a nice creepy story. You know, it's, it's a creepy kind of horror story about a voodoo mystery as usual as usual in a howard gordon script you have it's slightly convoluted we open on a and you know i guess it's a murder but it's not really a murder because it turns out that he wasn't dead uh but you have the private you know the he they it was supposedly a suicide except he was actually bewitched that's why he was seeing maggots in his breakfast cereal and and then you get to the you know to the refugee camp you there's corruption going on in there Obviously, the, the voodoo priest is the red herring. We are meant to believe maybe he's doing this. Yeah. And then we discover, no. It turns out that it's this, this army colonel, which, again, an interesting notion. But then why is he doing it? And then that's where you get into murky conspiracy stuff that doesn't really make any sense. Uh, his, his motivations are not entirely... Uh, I'm not really... The, the one thing that doesn't... That remains unclear for me is why. Because... I know, I get that he wants to kill those uh, those soldiers because they were going to testify against him, mm -hmm. right? But they were going to testify against him for being corrupt? For, like, what exactly, it, what, was it because they saw that he was taking an interest in, in voodoo rituals, and which clearly he developed an interest for when he was stationed in Haiti? So, right. you know, uh, it's, not, it's something that's been going on for years, clearly. And he has a relationship already with Bouvet, so mm -hmm. it, they have a history. They go back years. So, you know, does that have anything to do with the corruption that's going on in the refugee camp? I, you know, you, you know, I'm not sure. Um, of course, one of the privates goes into the fact that, you know, he he has ordered them to beat and abuse the refugees. A few times and that's why they they've personally had a lot of problems and 
you know, the refugees themselves keep saying, you know, we, we just want to go home. We just want to go home. We don't want to be here in this camp. <laughs> this is supposed to be a refugee camp for us to escape troubles, but the troubles are here. They're not back home. We want to go back home. We're having problems <laughs> here. He won't let us leave. It never really goes into why he doesn't want them to leave or why he, you know, wants them beaten and abused repeatedly. I mean, you could look at it as him being a sadist, but we're never really giving a cause for that. Like, obviously, he's enjoying his position of power and lording over them all, but we're never really given a reason beyond that for why he's acting this way, other than it's, you know, David Benzali getting to play an asshole general who's acting as a prison camp warden for the most part. There's that scene where he confronts Bouvet and he, you know, he's torturing him. Um, mm -hmm. And he says something to the something, something like, "I I want the power, give me the power." Some something, yeah. Uh, if I got that, something like that. He's sort of like it's like he needs Bouvet or he wants Bouvet to pass something on to him. But then that means that he just needs Bouvet. He doesn't need the whole, like everything else. You know, it's it it is a very unclear thing that the the villain's motivations. The villain's general motivations are unclear. I get that he wants to kill the people who could potentially incriminate him. Of course, mm -hmm. I get that he wants to do whatever he can to stop Mulder and Scully from uncovering the truth of his corruption. And I guess I'm to understand that it is his doing. He, he puts the, the thorns in the car, the thorns that pinch Scully. Yeah. That's his doing, right? Yeah, it, it had to have been. I guess you could look at it as he wants some sort of power from Bouvet, and in order to get it, he is just kind of holding this entire group of Haitians ransom and abusing them all until he gets what he wants. But Bouvet doesn't really seem, even at that point, inclined to give him what he wants, so he's just kind of sitting at a stalemate, but they never really go into all of it. Right, right. It's one of those situations where you have this sort of mishmash kind of a story. Yep. And that's the thing, that, that it manages to be entertaining uh, despite being a mishmash is to its credit. You know, I, 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 they, they do enough work with interesting imagery and some nice little shocking bits and pieces that work. I really enjoy, I thought it was a very interesting visual uh, when the Scully has her big freak out in the car. That's, yeah, uh, that was pretty cool. That was like something out of Wes Craven. I mean, that was like yeah. right out. You know, the I don't even. It's such a well done effect. You know, the it's it's creepy and gross and eerie and like a, a an entire man pops out of her hand. Is that basically yeah. what happens? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> like like comes out of her hand and starts choking her. Yeah, and it's just a random guy. That that that's the thing though that uh, that's the part that I find a bit strange, because in the beginning when you see the the private, it wasn't uh, Denim. Private private Denim was the other guy. Uh, you know the the guy that supposedly the guy that crashed his car into a tree. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, he's having very personal hallucinations. He's seeing maggots in his cereal. He's looking in the rearview mirror and seeing his face all rotted or whatever so you i get that but scully imagines a big heretofore unseen black man pop out of her hand and start choking her um and i thought that was an intriguing hallucination i i didn't understand why she would imagine that specifically you know why she wouldn't be imagining either you know daniel benzali or or any of the other characters that she had already met but rather just this random guy popping out of her hand you know what i mean yeah, it's, it's just a random voodoo priest and i don't know if it was meant to be benzali's character sending a projection to her to maybe further implicate the haitians and everything that's going on or what but it, it is odd but you know there's a lot of odd going on in the episode yeah, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. especially that kid you know we we have ghost kid here who likes to sell trinkets and eat french fries and collect frogs in the cemetery. So. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, that's the thing. He, he's not a, a specter. He's a physical being that many, several people interact with. Yeah. So it, that's what makes it uh, an intriguing thing that they throw out there. And to give you the impression that he was a zombie. I mean, I think the other possibility is that they thought he had died, but because he was under a voodoo spell, he didn't actually die. And so he was basically just like a walking, like a like a zombie. I mean, this this episode ends with a person being pronounced dead, and then the poetic justice is that he is being buried alive. Yep. Uh, so you know the whole that that was the big tagline from the Serpent and the Rainbow: "Don't bury me, I'm not dead." So, you know, I, I think that that's it's certainly appropriate. It's a great comeuppance for the villain to receive, but uh, it makes you sort of put things in perspective, that people who are thought to be dead were not actually dead. So maybe it's not so much that the kid's a ghost, but that he's he was a zombie or, or someone who was believed to be dead in the riots but didn't actually die. And that's why they were able to interact with him. But then you throw in the whole shape-shifting aspect too, and then that becomes, you put it in another, <laughs> put it in another level as well. And so, you know, you brought up the previous episode and we... We did discuss this a little bit with Clay, although we focused more on the whole cult aspect and and what are the things that they would... Um, we focused more on that. We didn't focus so much on the supernatural aspect, but you're right. I mean, even that episode sort of goes into spiritualism, go, goes into mystical, uh, into a mystical area where you have this this school teacher who, who may or may not be the devil, you know? Yeah. And that is a very, you know, that's your, when you're, when you start playing with those kinds of concepts, that's where you have that balance of, well, what is in the end, you like, what is the X-Files? And so at this point, what I'm starting to fully realize is that this is not really, it's not exclusively a sci-fi conspiracy show. Mm -hmm. It's not a sci-fi conspiracy thriller exclusively. And it's not like a sci-fi horror thing exclusively. It is, as I said at the, at the top, a kind of a catch-all, you know, uh, yeah. just a, a, a way for Chris Carter to indulge, Chris Carter and the writers, let's let's be frank, to indulge their their concerns with the genre in general. Mm -hmm. And being that it went, that I know that it goes on for at least another eight seasons, I can only imagine that things are going to get wilder and wilder. I, I don't know... Or is it going to be like, oh, you know, we need to start moving away from this mystical mumbo jumbo and just focus more on the sci-fi conspiracy angle because that's what this show is. I feel the show already has an identity and a strong one where they, when I say run into trouble, I only mean that if you're asking me to believe in it on a full level with, by sort of presenting me with grounded scientific concepts with scientifically grounded concepts and just sort of extrapolating them uh if you whether whether that's aliens or you know uh mythological creatures that roam the, the woods of new jersey or <laughs> i just think that that's that's what that's the thing that makes it a unique show the pe people when they when they look back on the x-files people who did not engage with it fully like myself probably just remember it as that that weird alien sci-fi thing from the 90s. But with episodes like this, you see that it clearly was more than that. Like the, yeah. there was more going on with the show than just an alien conspiracy thriller. Because if that's all the show had been, that's all the show would have been. But that's clearly not what it was. And it, it was so many other things too. Even if those things didn't work, I appreciate that they were trying to do all this kind of stuff in one show. Yeah, it's it's very much a melting pot, and that's something that I've always loved about it, you know. And and it'll carry on for the future seasons as we go along, but you know, you can have an episode like Firewalker where you have this weird stalk bursting out of people's throats and infecting people around them, and then you kick over and have a couple of serial killer episodes, and then you switch over to a wholesome small town where <laughs> the devil comes to collect his due and leaves it was nice to work with you scrawled on a chalkboard <laughs> for Mulder and Scully. And then we kick over and now we're, we've got a, uh, a voodoo infused uh, prison camp revenge thriller. 
And then, of course, after this, we will go back to the conspiracy for a two-parter. So it's just yeah, kind of like a roller coaster. You, you never really know what you're going to get when, when, you, when you sit down. And that's what I love about it. But also, I can, I can see why people who are used to more traditional shows might be frustrated by something like that. And I, and I, but I, I can also see why there are people who, uh, so why you have that fandom that falls into different camps. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. and then you have the people who essentially reject the mythology, you know, because they find it too convoluted or too like whatever. They just they they, they feel it wasn't paid off well enough, whatever. And for them, this is the X Files, these sort of random, creepy monster of the week episodes. So yeah, and I think we've said this before that it's like two shows. Yeah, you know, it, it's essentially two shows, and 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 you can decide what's the show you like. You know, do you just like the sort of random um, anthology, like horror anthology, where every week it's some weird thing going on? Or do you like the sort of wild conspiracy thriller? And that's two two different shows that are sort of smashed together into one thing. And it does work, I guess, on that level. Um, I had paused because I didn't I remembered the broad strokes of this episode, but I didn't remember all the details. And I'd paused it at the start because I didn't quite remember where I recognized Ben Zali from. And uh, <laughs> three things popped into mind. Uh, the first was A View to a Kill. He plays the shady land developer that's working with Zorin to snake land rights out from under people. And right. then he was also <laughs> got a sketchy uh, Secret Service agent in the Wesley Snipes movie Murder at 1600. That is correct. And and I guess the big one, which would probably be for me channel flipping and just catching snippets, was him being on Stephen Bochco's Murder One for, I guess, at least an entire full season. So it's just used to that, that just kind of really round and soft looking baby face with the deep voice coming out of it was just an image that had always seared into my mind, you know, from whenever that would be running on reruns on TV. But what was funny about that, and I unfortunately was thinking about it for the entirety of the rest of the episode, is I read this little nugget about his time on uh, Murder One. So I guess he was fired after a season or so. It says, Mm -hmm. Bochco later revealed that he fired Benzali because he refused to leave his home before he completed his morning bowel movement and was perpetually late to the set as a result. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah uh wow so uh well you know uh, yes well the morning bowel movement is a sacred thing i i, I mean if you if you I are someone who, yeah if, if you are someone who prides himself for being regular you know and, and, and you do what you need to make sure that this is the case and so for you that's that sacred moment where it's just you sitting on your throne Maybe you've got the morning paper. Maybe you're, you know, whatever it is that you've got going now. Maybe it's obviously probably now it's your tablet or whatever it is. But that is that sacred moment, you know. And some people, some people need a good half hour sitting on that Trump throne. And I guess, I guess uh, Daniel Benzali is one of those men who really, really enjoys that. And uh, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> that's quite something, though. I gotta say, uh, that's 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 quite something. Yeah, I remember Murder One. I never really watched it. I kind of neither did I. Were, I remember being intrigued by it. It used to air here on a cable channel called Sony Entertainment Television, which aired a lot of um, American uh, shows at the time, including a lot of these dramas. They were all sort of in one place, and so that's where you would see them. And I remember always seeing the ads for Murder One and wanting to catch it, but this is before the age of, you know, streaming or DVD collections or any of that. So basically, it was the sort of thing where if you wanted to follow a show, you had to like watch it week to week. And once I heard that the conceit of Murder One, it wasn't like a traditional procedural like Law and Order. As I understand it, basically each season would handle one case. Uh, like the so you know, if you just jumped in in the middle of the season, you probably weren't going to understand what the hell was going on. Yep. So that was always why. I was like, I guess eventually they'll rerun it, they'll rerun it, and I'll watch it then. But I just never got around to it. But his face would always show up in all the ads. And as yeah. you said, he has, he has a very <laughs> memorable kind of face. And so I was just like, yeah, this this guy's, you know, I didn't recognize him from A View to a Kill back then. And 
I just remember thinking, oh, the guy from Murder One. And so when I went to see Murder at 1600, which I went to see in theaters at, at, when it came out, I remember, oh, it's the guy from Murder One. Here he is yep. playing, the, playing the sort of shell. As you said, he's kind of the uh, backstabbing Secret Service dude. Um, that is intriguing to see him show up here. And I don't know what else he's done um, since. I don't think he's done too much stuff. I think he's sort of sort of faded. Maybe he just maybe he wound up on some other show that we don't know of. And Murder One, he was fired after the first season, but I don't know if it lasted more than two or three. I'm not sure if it did either. And given what you said about the way the uh, the structure of the seasons were, I'm not really too surprised given the early to mid 90s time frame because you know you were talking earlier about a lot of x-files fans fall into the monster of the week camp or the mythology camp and i think a lot of the reason why people disliked the mythology episodes at the time or at least have a memory of disliking them is because you know you can pop in on an episode like this and watch it this week and then miss the next few weeks and you're fine because it's a singular tale but with the mythology stuff you could get lost as especially the deeper we get into the show you know once you get around like season six or seven if you miss a couple of mythology episodes in a row you're really not going to know what's going on and i can see why that would definitely be off-putting to people at the time even i you know fell behind on a few of them and wasn't quite sure what was going on until i revisited the show later so a show like murder one doing the same thing but only that i can see how that you know, would lead to it not lasting as long as its contemporaries. There weren't too many serialized dramas. There were some, but there no. weren't too many, right? And so you have that situation where, and for networks and for production companies that do these series, at least back then, serialization is something that they resisted a lot because of the whole syndication deal. You know, the, yep. the idea of, of making lucrative syndication deals. And back then, uh, a syndication package was not as attractive um, if a, a network bought it and they had to air the episodes in a particular order. The, mm -hmm. Their idea is just, we're just going to go ahead and just air episodes every day. We don't give a shit. Yeah. Like, we have a whole block of episodes. We'll just air them and we've got a great syndication package. And so that's why they tended to resist serialization. And yeah, it wasn't until... The end of the 90s, the, the early aughts, when finally DVD started collecting entire seasons, the people realized, well, you know, yeah, there's a market for it now. Because now, yeah, you can either watch it week to week or you can go ahead and buy the DVD or rent the DVD and just take it all in when the whole season's over. And uh, now, but now that's all it is. You know, we, we've talked about this repeatedly. Now, oh, that's, yeah. now that's become the standard. Now it's the other way around. Now it's all about, uh, you know, serialization and mythology episodes if the x-files existed today it would be all mythology episodes probably i would imagine yeah. although you know i mean i haven't seen the revival so i'm going to be very curious after seeing the classic series to eventually juxtapose that with the revival seasons to see like if they follow the original pattern or if they're more like modern shows where they tell like a long story over you know several episodes or whatever but that, that'll be an interesting thing to see. All right, so is there anything else that we haven't mentioned about this episode that we uh, want to point out? One more thing. Callum Keith Rennie. <laughs> Popping yes. up again as the gun-toting yes. cemetery caretaker. <laughs> yes. Uh, one of those great character actors. He showed up before. You know, he was in uh, Lazarus. Lazarus, He yep. was in Lazarus. He was in Lazarus. And here he is again. I don't know. Like I, I, I will not be surprised if he shows up yet again, uh, at some point, uh, because they, I mean, he's one of those character actors that they could use multiple times playing different characters, and nobody would care. Clearly, so. he was. Uh, yeah. He was totally going to go shoot at that kid too, <laughs> which begs the question: Did he know? that Benzali was down in the coffin and just buried him anyway. Because his yep. dog would sit there whimpering like, hey, buddy, there's something wrong here. And he's like, nah, <laughs> just dumps it on yeah. there. I don't think he gives a shit. Uh, I mean, no. I, I think uh, like at that point, I, I didn't get a good look. He, For all we know, he could be listening to music, like just loud music, just enjoying his job. 
and doesn't even know and that doesn't even care because hey, i'm just here to do a job i'm here to... i don't think he'd care either way so. yeah you're like hey that guy ended up in a coffin i don't you know fuck it that's not my problem it's not my problem <laughs> Private asked, and I apprised him of what you found at the crime scene. What exactly did you tell him? If you're suggesting that I coerce Private Calvin in any way... I need to know that he signed that confession voluntarily. Of course he did. Since his reappearance, has Private McAlvin had any contact with Bavay? Not to my knowledge. Well, we'd still like to speak with Bavay. I'm afraid that's impossible. Why? Because he's dead. Last night he cut his wrists with a bed spring. Since both matters are being handled internally, I'll assume your business here is finished. And that is that. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. And if you did enjoy it, there are many ways you can support the podcast, which is available on Anchor FM, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other platforms. You can subscribe, you can rate and or review it depending on what platform you're enjoying it on, and of course, you can share and spread the word on social media. Please do any or all of these things. Every little bit helps. Look for the Eric's Antoine Network on Facebook or on YouTube. You can also follow me on Twitter at Eric's Antoine Net and check out my film reviews on Letterboxd. You should also check out Daniel Baldwin's website, theschlocketeer.com, and follow him on Twitter, at Daniel W. Baldwin. I'm Eric's Antoine, and I'll be back in a few days, I mean it this time, when Daniel and I will be discussing another epic two-part story split across the episodes Colony and Endgame. I promise a more regular release schedule for the remainder of the season. So please do stay tuned for that episode, and until then... Please remember that the truth is out there. See you next time.